In fact, I've seen conversations among portfolio managers in other firms where the benchmark is their bogey. And shall I be 10 basis points above on this name or 10 below? That's a ridiculous way to invest. It's absolutely ridiculous. You need to take a white sheet of paper and say, what is the world going to look like? Not what has what has happened and what does the world look like? If you are an Empire listener, hopefully you've played around on chain. And if you have done that, you know that transferring assets across different chains is a pain, to put it nicely. That is why we are incredibly excited to have the Wormhole Foundation as a partner of the Empire podcast, stewards of the Wormhole protocol, supporting over 30 different blockchains and six different runtimes. Stay tuned later in the show. We have a cool thing that you can claim, which is a Wormhole NFT just for Empire listeners. This episode is brought to you by Monad, which has not only the highest performance EVM L1 architecture ever built, but also the wildest and craziest community in crypto. Monad's internal devnet is live and public testnet comes out soon. So make sure you join the Monad community today at discord.gg forward slash Monad, M-O-N-A-D, Monad. This episode is brought to you by Shardium an EVM-based smart contract platform with state sharding and auto-scaling. Shardium is designed to achieve horizontal scaling to ensure sustainably low transaction fees for you, the end user. You'll learn more about Shardium and auto-scaling later in the show. This episode is brought to you by Supra, an Oracle provider across more than 50 different blockchains. If you are building anything in crypto, you likely need verifiable randomness and you need oracles. Well, for Empire listeners, Supra is now offering a limited deal. It is 12 months of Supra free for any Empire listener. You can go to supra.com, that's S-U-P-R-A.com forward slash Blockworks. Limited time only, go check it out. Thanks Supra for sponsoring Empire. All right, everyone. Long awaited episode. I've been excited about this one for a while. We have Kathy Wood, founder of ARK Invest. We have Ophelia Snyder, uh, the co founder and president of 21 Shares. So, Ophelia, Kathy, welcome to the show. Thank you, Yano. Very happy to be here. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Yeah, excited about this. Okay, Kathy, I'm going to pick on you to kind of take us into this conversation. Um, you you recently published, you both published your big ideas for 2024, and then you published a smaller piece that was titled, I think the journey from monetary shock to innovation-led economic boom. I would love for you to tee up this conversation by just walking us through that piece and like your kind of yeah explanation of of of, of how we got to the place that we got to today. Yeah. Um, yes. Okay. Well, thank you. Yeah, and we call it, we summarized it as the journey back because uh, uh, that really references how uh, long duration assets were pummeled during 21 and 22 as interest rates went up. So interest rates, uh, the Fed increased interest rates 24 fold. That has never happened in history. Uh, you go back to the 80s when Chairman Volcker was trying to put a stop to inflation and he took interest rates up twofold. You know, this was more than 10 times that magnitude. And many people were dismissing it, saying, oh, interest rates were so low. You know, back then they were 10 percent. He went to 20 percent. Yeah, they had been getting the businesses. Consumers had been getting used to it over 10 years, uh, maybe more than that. <clears throat> this time it was just a shock. And uh, uh, what we believe has happened is a rolling recession here in the United States, Housing is down 20 to 40 percent, depending on, on the me measure. Uh, autos are in they're not in expansion territory. They're more they're closer to recession territory in the 15 to 16 million unit annualized rate range. Uh, you have commercial real estate uh, in a world of hurt office and now multifamily. You have bank deposits still leaving the system. They're still negative on a year over year basis. And in fact, they're um, they're now negative over last year's negative, so it's a, a double whammy. We don't think the uh, regional bank crisis is over, and finally, companies are losing pricing power. <clears throat> so inflation, as measured by the CPI, has come down from nine percent to three percent. So we no longer have to fight the we're in a '70s style inflation. 
and, and it's not going away. This is, uh, you know, we're, we're going to end up in the high single digits. So we're not there. We're at 3%. Now people are saying, oh, stagflation. This is still, we haven't reached uh, the Fed's 2%. <clears throat> we listen to earnings uh, re- reports and listen very carefully for pricing power. Companies are losing pricing power. Those who are trying to fight the unit uh, unit declines with higher prices to salvage their margins are getting hurt, and they're going to end up cutting prices. Uh, Walmart saying prices uh, are negative. Def- we're in deflation, uh, and Costco is saying they're flat, moving into deflation. So um, we think companies are going to lose pricing power, and that is going to accelerate the shift towards innovative solutions to this problem. And uh, that's what our five major innovation platforms are all about. So robotics, energy storage, artificial intelligence, blockchain technology, and multi-omic sequencing. So they touch every sector and they are converging. And this is what we think uh, a lot of traditional asset managers are missing, the convergence between and among these technologies. Uh, and they're highly deflationary. Now, many people are saying, well, wait a minute, isn't isn't Bitcoin a hedge against inflation? Isn't that the reason to own it? Uh, why do you own, why are you such a big proponent of it when you think there's actual deflation happening? <clears throat> well, <clears throat> if you look, um, when we first took, uh, when we took our first exposure to Bitcoin in 2015, it was $250 and and you know, traditional asset managers and others in the ETF space uh, were making fun of that decision. And so we paid very close attention to the daily moves. And at the time, uh, Greece was threatening to leave uh, the, the European Union. And we were worried about uh, you know, a relapse into the European sovereign debt crisis. Well, if you were watching Bitcoin very carefully back then, you saw it nudged up every time that, uh, that there was a flare up uh, around Greece. And that gave us confidence that Bitcoin might be a risk off asset as well as a risk on mm-hmm. asset. And that was confirmed last year during the regional bank crisis when regional banks imploded and Bitcoin went up 40 to 50%. So I think uh, this recognition that, uh, and I know I've, 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 you know, pivoted here a little bit from that paper uh, to the topic at hand. But I think that realization that Bitcoin is not only a risk on asset, you know, a technology, uh, you know, as technology is, uh, but it is a risk off asset in terms of counterparty risk. There's no counterparty risk here like there is in the banking system. Yeah. I want to ask one more question about this like big global macro, because that'll then tie into this conversation about Bitcoin and crypto and Ethereum and things like that. How do you grapple with the fact that it does feel like most of the, um, I don't I don't even know the right word, like the old world companies, like Home Depot and UPS and uh, uh, Kraft Heinz and 3M are, are struggling, right? Yes, They're really exactly. struggling. Then you yes. have these countries at a sovereign level struggling as well, Europe, UK, Japan, China, either in recession or on the brink of recession. But then you have like what feels like the most exciting technologies ever in the history of the like this AI boom and robotics and and crypto. Like, how do you grapple with where the world and like maybe where US GDP is going based on those two like very different uh, ends of the spectrum? It's a great qu- question, Yano. Uh, first of all, you're hitting on something important when you mention those those companies, I know I put them in the report, they are, their revenue growth is negative. Now, a large part of that is the rest of the world. And now we're getting flash, flash points, Nigerian Naira down two thirds. This is one of the wealthiest countries in Africa. And, and their population has lost two thirds of its purchasing power in dollar terms. And, uh, and probably two thirds of its wealth because they tend not to be well diversified. Uh, you had Egypt just devalue by 40%. This has all happened since I wrote that paper, uh, the, the 40% decline. Um, of course, Argentina under Millet is basically 
becoming uh, honest about where that that currency, the peso, uh, should be. The black market had it right. Uh, it was worth half as much as what the government was saying. So we're seeing, and, and I actually think Bitcoin might be a reason for this. Mm. You know, many people now understand they can have a hedge against inflation and, as I said, deflation um, uh, associated with counterparty risk uh, with some Bitcoin. And I think this could be causing uh, a little bit of a domino effect. I, I, I don't want to I, I don't want to you know, create alarm or anything for mm-hmm. Uh, you know, other governments. But, you know, I think that this idea that Bitcoin is an insurance policy is um, is uh, is important and maybe behind some of the devaluations we're going to we're seeing out there. Um, I think there is a global recession underway. You, you said it. And in the U.S., this this, you know, the 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 technologies uh, versus the economy uh, these are booming technologies. When you get a uh, technologically enabled innovation, um, it's highly deflationary. And we've got these five platforms. We haven't seen anything like this since the late 1800s, early 1900s. Telephone, electricity, internal combustion engine, deflationary period, right? And those were deflationary technologies. So we're seeing a lot of cross currents in the US. It's very confusing. In the employment report, you get uh, non-farm payroll employment moving up. You get household employment moving down, right? That's interesting. We've lost a million jobs, and that household employment is what feeds into the unemployment rate. Even with GDP, if you look at real GDP on a year-over-year basis, it's up more than 3%. But if you look at its identity, uh, gross domestic income, they, they should equal one another, that one's slightly down on a year-over-year mm. basis. And I think what's happening is the, the, there, there could be some immigration uh, distortions here. We're trying to figure that out. But also innovation, because it's moving so rapidly, there are the, the measurement systems in place right now were born in the industrial age, and they're trying to catch up. Uh, and so we would not be surprised at the end. It's going to feel a little chaotic, and you're going to have – you know, conflicting cross currents, I think, while this is going on. But when all is said and done, we think these technologies are now beginning to move the needle and that real growth, this is what we mean by economic boom, uh, as deflation really happens. And the Fed, the Fed yeah. wants 2% inflation, they're going to get negative inflation. As that happens, uh, there will be very significant unit growth from these new technologies, but there will also be what's known as creative destruction, if you've studied Schumpeter. Uh, And uh, a lot of companies think traditional autos, internal combustion engine. If we're right, electric vehicle prices keep going down to the $20,000 to $25,000 range. The traditional auto market is out of business. So that's creative destruction. Ophelia, I want to throw this to you and maybe just a little context because we jumped right into this uh, conversation. So the reason we wanted to have Ophelia and Kathy on the show is uh, you you both have, um, yeah, ARK, ARK and 21 shares have partnered for the, the ARK 21 shares Bitcoin ETF, which I will just give you both a massive round of applause here. I think you're sitting at fourth right now um, behind, well, there's, there's Grayscale, which already, you know, had their obviously GBTC and stuff like that. So in the new players, it's BlackRock. Uh, fidelity and then the the arc b so i don't know how i don't know how you both are feeling but i would uh i feel like it's a pretty good place to be sitting but yeah congrats to both of you we're we're really excited about it i think it's been a fantastic launch far in excess of what anyone expected these products to perform this quickly i mean realizing it hasn't even been 90 days yet It's nuts. It's nuts. The reason I wanted to like lead in with that conversation about, um, you know, these countries are in recession, the kind of quotes around this old school companies are struggling is there was this conversation I had with my co-founder two weeks ago where we were talking about like, do you sell, let's say you sell your ass, let's say you try to time the top of the crypto cycle. And we've been in, we've seen a couple cycles in crypto. Let's say you try to time the top and you maybe sell the top of crypto. We both, the conversation winded and ended up in this 
with us asking this question of what else would you allocate to? Really, what else? What else? What, do you, what like? Are you just buying the S and P then? When we believe that there are these kind of revolutionary technologies are out there, like really, what else would you allocate to outside of crypto? And the, Ophelia, I guess what I wanted to ask you is when you're in the room with some of these asset managers, um, and you're talking about, I don't like Arc B and, and and the products. You guys offer a bunch of other products as well outside of that. Like, what? How are people feeling about? Bitcoin, I, I guess I'd say Bitcoin first and then like crypto more broadly. And you, you, I guess you can take that in any direction there. But So I, I think it's important to realize what institutional behavior looks like when you come into mm. a new asset class. And, and this is a new asset class, right? And, and yes, it can fit into commodity buckets. And yes, you can think of it in a store of value, but, but it is a fundamentally something new and different, right? And we're trying to find corollaries, but there, there is quite a bit that's novel here. The behavior is quite simple. You go from, this is crazy. Why would I buy this? To, well, wait a second. Now I need to at least have an opinion about this. And I think that's where most of the United States pretty radically shifted into in January. Went from being completely fine to have no opinion whatsoever on crypto. And you could tell your clients that and they wouldn't find that weird. To now clients not accepting that as an answer. You you can say you hate it, but you need to have a well-founded opinion. It needs to be based on something and not just whatever. And I think that was a pretty big shift. And we've seen that happen in other markets. It happened in Europe a few years ago. It's continuing to happen. The arrival of the US ETFs has accelerated that globally. But I think that's really where we're sitting. They're developing opinions. Mm -hmm. You then see people do what I would call like testing the waters or dipping a toe in. They'll throw like a tiny allocation, like a something to see how does this perform in my portfolio? How do my clients react to this? You know, these are still 70 vol products, right? And and you're not going to get the kinds of returns that you see without volatility, that, that's literally definitionally how you measure volatility. You, you, you need, the, they, they go together. Um, this is not, but it's not something, you know, a lot of more traditional investors are used to seeing in their portfolio. They're used to much more steady returns um, in some respects. And I think, so you're seeing people add a little bit, then you'll start to see them build full allocations. And and we've had customers, uh, not, not in the US market, because obviously that's newer, but we've had institutional customers in other markets who started by allocating ten or or $100,000 to Bitcoin in a multi-hundred million dollar portfolio, just so they like kept an eye on it and had a reason to look at it. And now they hold tens, some of our clients hold hundreds of millions mm-hmm. in in assets ranging from Bitcoin to some pretty esoteric alts. And I think there's definitely a learning curve there. Um, we're very early in that in the U.S. Like the educational process for learning what these assets are and understanding how they can fit in your portfolio is very, very early still. Yeah. Yeah. No. I. I. This is. I'd love to um, pipe in here a bit because uh, when you ask that question, where else would we go? I think um, what you what your um, alluding to is if you look at the S and P 500 and NASDAQ, um, and, and you look at what's at the top of, uh, each of those, you know, the companies there are, are, they've hit that level because of past success. And if the world is going to be disrupted and, you know, the traditional world order is going to be disintermediated, um, That's probably not the place to go. However, and we've been fighting this battle for 10 years, uh, including Bitcoin, and and we are providing exposures to the new innovation, the way the world is going to work. And what has happened, and and it's unfortunate, I think it's the most massive misallocation of capital in history, is after the tech and telecom bust, and even more so after 08, 09, there was a move towards risk aversion or risk mitigation. And, and, and what did that mean to the traditional world? It meant, let me get close to my benchmark. Let me get close to the S&P 500. Let me get close to the NASDAQ. In fact, I've seen conversations uh, among portfolio managers in other firms where, you know, the benchmark is their bogey. And shall I be... 10 basis points above on this name or 10 below, that's a ridiculous way to invest. It's absolutely ridiculous. Uh, You need to take a white sheet of paper and say, what is the world 
going to look like, not what has what has happened and what does the world look like. Uh, you, and especially given how quickly these technologies are moving. And the great thing for, for ARC in terms of everything that we do, and I know it's true for 21 shares, but they only do uh, digital assets. But the great thing for us is there is a new investor who understands and accepts this notion that volatility is part of the price you pay uh, for this new asset class. And many, many, uh, we've been referred to just our basic ETFs and in innovation as a new asset class as well. That mm. is, we're not a new asset class. These are equities. Bitcoin and digital assets, that's a new asset class. But now we have an investor that understands that volatility is part of what you need to expect. They are, I'm not saying they're comfortable with the downside volatility. They love the upside volatility. Volatility is a very good thing on the upside. So I think this whole space, this new asset class is helping um, investors understand what we've been trying to communicate for the last 10 years hmm. through Bitcoin, of course, but also through these other innovation platforms. Yeah, and, and for what it's worth, I am not an equities person, but I've been, uh, that, that is actually one of the reasons I started looking at ARC products years ago for my own portfolio, because I did struggle and, you know, it shouldn't come as any surprise. You know, if you think about like personal portfolios, I'm massively overweight crypto. I think yeah, Kathy is too, right? Like we're we're pretty overweight. This is a real conversation my wife expect. and I were having. She's like, you know, we're like, I we have too much of our you know net worth in, in crypto and Bitcoin. I'm like, what 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 else are we buying? Go look at the S and P. Like, I don't want to own Home Depot and Chevron and yeah. Accenture right now. I'm sorry, I just you know I don't. So and it's oh. it, it's interesting. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I've struggled with that question myself. I and I remain very overweight crypto. And, and, and thank you for saying that, Ophelia. I yeah. um, we it's to me it's astonishing. To me, this is back to the future. When I started in the business, I was in college, 1977. What Arc is doing now is what we were doing back then. We're trying to envision how is the future going to evolve. And we were in 1977 talking about Hong Kong 1997, 20 years in the future. And that became a very productive conversation over time, right? We were ready for uh, uh, the handover and uh, you know what might happen after that. We were ahead of, ready for uh, China integrating more into the global economy. Now I know that it's doing the opposite right now, but you know, you, you have to think about the way the world is going to work, not the way the, that it has worked. And that is why our strategies, we feel, are uh, fulfilling an unmet need. That's why I started ARC. Yeah. So when you, maybe taking, going deeper into crypto for a second, there are kind of three ways to slice crypto in my mind. And I think, I forget, I might've actually taken this from an ARC thing, or maybe it was a Chris Bernisky thing at one point in time, but there's there's like the money revolution, the financial revolution and uh, the internet revolution, right? Next. There's kind of the Chris Dixon way of explaining the internet and web one to web two to web three. There's kind of the Bitcoiner way of saying, you know, Keynes, uh, Austrian economics and, you know, you know, Bitcoin is, is better money or, or better gold, whatever you want to say. And then there's the financial revolution, right? DeFi, or, you know, JP Morgan and everything's built on COBOL from 1970s and it's this archaic system. And there's, yes. you know, we just need to revolutionize finance. How do you both, exp I, Ophelia, I imagine you've done a lot of the money revolution or the selling Bitcoin recently, but as, as, as ETH comes into play for these ETFs and maybe we push past that, we're going to have to think about how we talk about the internet revolution, the financial revolution to some of the big institutions. Be curious how you think about kind of slicing these three buckets up and, and, and kind of what lands and what doesn't land right now. So... I think the financial revolution side of things and the internet revolution side does land. I think there's a very clear understanding. Mm. And typically the analogies I've seen resonate is um, when people talk about social media, right? The, the movement from being able to actually create content and content creator networks is something that obviously I think is quite tactile and quite something people understand. 
the, the progression in technology and the progression in the use of technology changes. And so this idea of transitioning towards actual ownership of assets, um, I think is something that has resonated historically quite well. I think the other thing to realize is, especially once you start getting into some of the narratives like DeFi, um, they actually understand this pretty well. It's their jobs, right? Like if you don't understand how to, you know, write a swap and you work in finance, they're, they, they understand these products and they understand what those rails look like. So I think especially as you start to talk to people who have been in this space for a long time, there's an appreciation for innovation in this area. And I don't think it's actually that hard of a sell. I think it's quite easy for somebody to appreciate, especially if you spent any time in it. I was talking about this earlier today and I, Kathy knows this, but I'm a huge history nerd. And I think one of the things we often forget when we think about uh, financial revolutions and you know movements towards new new technology and new technology adoption, especially in financial markets, everything in financial markets exists in a certain way for a reason. It may not be a good reason. A very simple example is a ticker. Why why are tickers four letters? They don't need to be. It's an illogical thing, right? Why why do we limit ourselves to four letters? Why are three letters better? Like what happened there? Why do most Crypto assets have four letter tickers. It actually has to do with the structure of ticker tapes and the ability to physically produce documentation in the twenties and based on technology limitations that are just irrelevant. But we've we've adopted that as a standard. And there's no reason to do it that way. There's a lot of things in fine in finance generally that are that way. There are a lot of things in the internet that are that way. Right? They're conventions because they made sense 20 years ago or 30 years ago that, that no longer apply. And I think one of the things that there's a real appreciation for is I think linking to that and saying like, look, we, we do things a certain way. Yes, but you don't need to. And there's a way to actually accelerate this. And if you have that appreciation for why it was done a certain way and you're able to articulate that in some way and say like, Hey, look, we all know why we all know why we use two plus two settlement. Does it make sense in a digital era? No, but we understand why it is that way. It, it has to do with historical precedent and, and we can, we can make this better without necessarily you know, throwing the baby out with the bathwater, there is a piece of this that makes sense. And I think typically once you start explaining innovation in that way of saying, hey, this is a logical continuation of the way we do things and it makes it better and it makes it faster and easier and more accessible and more democratized and gives you more control over it. Um, I think they're really able to see that, especially because a lot of the things that we're talking about are very... Um, are very tangible for people, right? Like the internet is a very tangible thing. We all use it every day. We're using it right now. People actually do understand these things in a much more visceral way than, you know, I think, I mean, I, I certainly don't do things in, in genomics, but to me, I, the, something about the use cases we frequently discuss for blockchain feel a lot more tangible to people uh, when they first come into the space than I think other forms of innovation where that can be much more abstract. Sort of like uh, AI pre-chat GPT. Um, blockchain, I think, has that tangibility, which is helpful. And I think, um, and and this Chris Berniski also did uh, coin recently. You know, the 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 DeFi can sound intimidating to people, defiant, and so forth. So he was saying, look, the way to help people understand what this is, as Ophelia just said, is. This is the internet financial system. This is what the developers did not put in place in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, as they were evolving the internet, because they never thought the financial services or commerce would take place on, uh, on this thing that we're all using now. So uh, I think stepping back and talking about it that way, and then also uh, describing, you know, how young people are behaving, even the most seasoned investors out there, they have children or grandchildren, and they're looking at how they spend their time. And they know that half of more than half of their leisure time or discretionary time is spent online. And so this notion of social status moving online uh, with these immutable uh, digital assets uh, is a thing. They're not doing it, but they see their children and grandchildren doing it. So if you if you kind of describe what's going on out there right now to people who just put it in context, and, and Ophelia is absolutely right. When you think about the internet, how much it has been built out over the past 30 years, 
that's that's kind of priming the pump. And now you're just putting this IFS in, this internet financial system with uh, native currencies native to to the internet, taking out the middlemen, bringing in more peer to peer. It begins to make a lot more sense to people yeah. who just wouldn't even think about it before. And there's a piece that's also just, and, and you kind of said this right. We, as an industry, we love calling things names that sound cool on paper that are fundamentally not that helpful in terms of getting people to understand and adopt the standard. At the end of the day, if you actually want Bitcoin, blockchain, crypto, digital assets, NFTs to actually do what they're supposed to do, you need a couple billion people using them regularly. That That's actually the bar, right? You need to get to a place where adoption looks like the internet. You're talking about billions of users. That's that's the goal. And you need to get there as quickly as humanly possible. And if you want to think about Bitcoin and, and store of value and you want to compete with gold, you're talking about basically everybody. Right. Mm. You, you need you need to be getting close to that seven billion number. One billion is not going to help you that much. And I think sometimes we forget that, which means at the end of the day, our industry needs to be about transparency, accessibility and welcome to everybody. Because at the end of the day, whether you think self-custody is the greatest thing since sliced bread, or you only ever want to use an intermediated product because you don't even enjoy having, you don't enjoy having cash in your wallet, why would you want to have Bitcoin on your laptop? You need both. And right. you need them all, right? Like this is very much like a gotta catch them all Pokemon kind of thing here. To you, That's what it needs to be. You actually need to capture every single one of these sub verticals and actually welcome them in. And I agree with what Chris says around DeFi and we, we do yeah. have that as an issue, right? Even think about the word crypto, right? Cryptography is not accessible to people sort of definitionally. There's, there's a reason why you see people prefer nomenclature like digital assets. Yeah, It is a lot more welcoming. And I got into crypto because of my mom. I, I realized that's maybe a weird one. My mom introduced me to crypto in 2013 um, and she's kind of amazing, but even it didn't feel welcoming to her. It, it still not, doesn't necessarily. And I think that's yeah. not to our advantage when having these conversations. Yeah, it's funny. So we, one of the events that BlockWorks hosts, we have a big event called Permissionless with the folks at Bankless that we do. We have mm -hmm. another one called Digital Asset Summit, DAS. And the reason mm -hmm. we called it DAS is because, or Digital Asset Summit, is we tried hosting a crypto event in 2018. And no, nobody wanted to come or none of the, our, our audience at the time, very institutional crowd, very B2B type of event, uh, kind of the suits coming to learn about the space is what we wanted to set up. Nobody wanted to come. As soon as we called it Digital Asset Summit, then we started getting people there. So, um, mm -hmm. but yeah, and Ophelia, I, I, as a fellow, um, I'm a, I was a history major and fellow history nerd. And there's this, um, there's this piece of history I love, which is Mark Andreessen talking about the internet and what he calls the original sin, right? Which ties into what Chris is talking about as well with internet money. He said the original sin is, it would have made a lot of sense to build uh, to build into the browser the ability to spend money, but that didn't happen. And as he says, he says, quote, I think the original sin was that we didn't actually build economics, which is to say money at the core of the internet. It was just a protocol that was left out, so. Hey everyone, wanted to give a big shout out to today's sponsor, Wormhole Foundation, stewards of the Wormhole Protocol. If you are like Santi and I and you play around on chain, you know how bad the cross-chain experience is today. Well, Wormhole has set out to solve that, powering cross-chain transfers for over 200 different multi-chain teams, including some of the best like Uniswap and Circle. So what does that mean for you, the Empire listener? This opens up a huge number of multi-chain use cases across DeFi, NFTs, governance, oracles, and more. By supporting over 30 different blockchains and six different runtimes, including SUI, Solana, different ETH L2s, Ethereum, and a whole bunch more. That means you have now the most powerful interoperability platform at your fingertips. If you're a developer, you'll be excited to hear that Wormhole provides an extensive suite of tools and infrastructure so that you can securely build multi-chain applications. But don't just take our word for it, obviously. Wormhole Protocol leads the industry in all-time messages transferred with over 900 million cross-chain messages. 900 million, that is close to a billion, and that's a big number of messages. As a thank you, Wormhole Foundation is dropping exclusive NFTs. That's right. We got some exclusive NFTs for Empire listeners. Hit the link in the description to claim your unique Wormhole NFT today.
This episode is brought to you by Monad. Monad's thesis is simple. The EVM is here to stay, similar to JavaScript and Web2, but unfortunately, today's EVM lacks the high performance and the scalability that developers need to make certain applications possible. Monad addresses these concerns and these bottlenecks while preserving seamless EVM composability for application developers. There's a seamless transition to Monad as the Ethereum RPC API allows for really easy portability. And for developers, Monad Monad can support 10,000 real transactions per second with their unique parallel execution environment. And of course, there's full compatibility with EVM bytecode. Monad's internal DevNet is live. Public testnet comes out soon. You can join Monad's journey in two ways. One, go follow them. They're on Twitter, at Monad, M-O-N-A-D underscore X-Y-Z. And also join the Monad Discord. It's discord.gg forward slash Monad. Big thanks to Monad for sponsoring Empire. This episode is brought to you by Shardium. Shardium is an EVM-based, linearly scalable smart contract platform that provides low gas fees while maintaining security through dynamic state sharding. Shardium's auto-scaling works by automatically adjusting the resources of the system or the application based on predefined rules and metrics. What this means is that when an application on Shardium goes viral, gets big, right, the network reacts by independently adding more active validator nodes from the standby node pool to increase throughput capacity. This does four things. It lowers energy consumption, lowers cost, improves load management, and protects app failures. You can learn more about Shardium or even spin up your node at shm.gg forward slash validator. That's shm.gg forward slash validator. Big thanks to Shardium for sponsoring Empire. This episode is brought to you by Supra, an Oracle provider across over 50 different blockchains. Whether it's critical price levels or liquidation triggers, beat your competition to the punch with Supra. It's as good as having the first mover advantage on every price update. Supra offers fast oracles and DVRF free for 12 months at supra.com forward slash blockworks for a limited time only. So you're gonna wanna bank on this 12 month free offer as soon as possible. And if you're just listening and you know any builders, you can earn $1,500. That's $1,500 that you can go throw into Bonk or Whiff or whatever meme coin you like by letting them know about this deal. They can get fast oracles today free for 12 months and you get $1,500 for the referral. You can visit supra.com forward slash blockworks to learn more. Go check them out. Tell them Santi sent you. Tell them Jason sent you. We got you back. Thanks Supra for sponsoring. Maybe can you take us into the, in, like deeper into the Bitcoin ETF. So launched in January, we're like three and a half months in. There's seven, what, 75 billion of that. If you include Grayscale, there's like roughly 75 billion of assets in, in this. BlackRock's the leader, then Fidelity, then uh, the ARCB, ARC21 shares, uh, Bitcoin ETF. I think you're sitting a, a little under 3 billion right now. What um what, What's coming next, right? There are conversations, this could be a conversation around the wirehouses, conversation around ETH ETF, conversation around like assets beyond Bitcoin and, and, and ETH. Maybe we could start actually with the wirehouses. I'd love to know why this is kind of the, the next important unlock and when this comes. And yeah, I would love, would love to have a conversation around that. Um, I, so R Resolute is our distribution partner, has been for all of our ETFs and now for uh, these digital assets, uh, digital asset uh, products. Um, <clears throat> And what we're learning is that wirehouses, when they learned that 11 of us were going after this market, uh, the first thing they need, they have been doing due diligence, but they're not going to do due diligence on all 11. And they know not all 11 will make it, that they're probably, I mean, uh, Philly, I don't know what, what you, you say, but, uh, you know, I say three or four make it. I guess I have to yeah, say three. Four because of uh, three to five. Can yeah. you explain what, why that? So the long tail of the ETFs will, will what? They'll stay in business, but just like no one will allocate to them. They'll disappear and shut down. What, well, what? You know, it's interesting. Galaxy had its conference call yesterday. And uh, according to Galaxy, Invesco is waiting for wealth managers to put uh, crypto on their platforms to approve. And uh, uh, maybe Invesco is uh, very good in that space. So each one has a strength. Now, what we feel great about is 
most of our while most of our ETFs are distributed through the the wirehouses, so Morgan Stanley, UBS, uh, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Wells Fargo. Um, not one of them has put us on uh, its platform. And uh, why is this? They wanted to see who the survivors were going to be. They do not want to put their client's money into a fund that will ultimately shut down. So I think that is becoming clear, although you will have each one of the, the, the bottom six or seven saying, no, it, you know, you have to give us until this happens. In the case of uh, Invesco, I guess it's the wealth managers. We have not had our primary clients uh, uh, buy into this yet. They're doing due diligence on a lot of things, critically on infrastructure and ops. And of course, that's uh, Aphelia's 21 shares, um, uh, Bailiwick. And, and they've, you know, the great thing for us, and one of the reasons we wanted to partner with them is they have been battle testing the, the infrastructure and ops for the last five years over what now is roughly 45, 46 um, offerings, different funds, right? Through booms, busts, through halvings, through forks, through airdrops. And, you know, those are all, <clears throat> those are all events that, um, that traditional asset managers are, are not, well, they've not been through some of them. So, uh, th that that's uh, that's the first thing they're looking at. They're really doing in-depth research on this, and um, I'm sure Ophelia will get into that a bit more. They also need to know that their clients and they are going to be supported by two things: research, and we give our research away, as does uh, Twenty One Shares Research, and we're prolific. We're putting something out every week on something in the digital asset space. And they need to know that they, whether they're advisors or other asset allocators, <clears throat> uh, are going to be able to call someone who really understands the space. And so Resolute, our distribution partner, has been working with us since 2016. And I remember the most senior ETF specialist uh, laughs because as she was coming to her interview, uh, apparently she had to look up what Bitcoin was in 2016. Now, they have to know a lot more than what Bitcoin is. They have to know a lot about Bitcoin and these other digital assets now that we're putting out these other funds. I think one of the things to realize, and, and this is, you know, to illustrate that point, it's very from another market, is we we actually ran a, a Luna product uh, when, when Luna existed. And Obviously, that did not go well, um, but our clients were so aware of potential risks and mm -hmm. what the research was saying. And hey, there's this, you know, this tie-in with, with Anchor and all these other things. And, and they both felt well informed, so they were educated on the risks they were taking. They wanted to take them anyway. They took them, and when things didn't go well, they were actually our infrastructure held longer than everyone else's. So we were able to continue operating and trading these products effectively, efficiently, people were able to come in, get out. There are people who bought product at that time thinking there would be a recovery. Like we were able to support that on an ongoing basis, entirely infrastructurally during what you could think of as one of the worst possible crises that could happen on a blockchain, right? The, 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 right. the DPEG around Luna is catastrophic and the products were able to continue to operate. And we actually ended up having a bunch of very, very large institutional clients switch to our product suite because the research across their entire crypto allocation, because the research that we're able to get that support, they were able to pick up the phone, hear from analysts, this is what's going on, here's how to think about it and have that support. And in crypto especially, that's critical because it's not just about what you don't want in crypto is fair weather friends. I think that's what Kathy's getting at, right? You want someone who's going to be there in the trenches with you going to provide you with that research, upside and downside risks, going to help you understand why you're making these allocations, what these allocations are doing in your portfolios. And by the way, when things aren't great, be able to pick up the phone, stand up and say, yes, here is here are the circumstances that are leading to this. It's either, you know, this is happening on chain or, you know, macro has moved in this way and here's more research to support it. And the consistency of that over the cycle is critical. Um, and so from our perspective, I think we've seen a couple of things. We've seen that client service and research be extraordinarily important. We actually, um, 
I, I will say this absolutely shamelessly, but, but even before we had this partnership, we, we may have uh, pilfered uh, ARC's research playbook, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Care of a Coffee Cafe that I had one. many years ago. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it, it's been very, very helpful in supporting our customers. And I think nice. one of the other things we've seen in going back to the warehouses, they care about safety for their customers. Cause the worst possible thing for them is either the product shuts down, in which case they have to liquidate all their customers and there are tax implications of that. And it's not a good look for anybody. Uh, and there are obviously you're basically locking in whatever gains and losses there were. You have to explain it to clients. They're not happy. Like it, it's not a good situation. So they want to make sure there's longevity to the products and they want to make sure they're not going to be other issues and other issues is, you know, what does your capital market setup look like? How tradable are these products? What does custody look like? Because what most people don't realize is institutional custody in crypto is not a one size fits all. There's no out of the box implementation. You basically get an out of the box technology, which is then implemented within your organization. So what controls process have you brought around this? Uh, how do you think about risk and compliance? How do you think about KYC AML? How are you handling, mm -hmm. you know, security? Are you storing all of those assets in a single wallet or have you distributed them? Well, actually, we, we distribute them because it's it's safer, right? You, you're essentially diffusing a uh, you're diffusing a tax surface, which makes it much harder for there to be major compromises. For example, small thing, right? How many steps have you put in your approval process? Why does the approval process work that way? How many points of validation are you doing? Um, these types of questions is what you're getting into. It's extremely in depth, and it's typically highly operational. So one of the things that I've been really excited about is. Uh, I get, a, I get a reason to talk about our operational setup uh, and at the level of detail that no one has ever been interested in before, but we built a lot in there to ensure that clients are getting the safest, most effectively traded product possible. So you want low spreads, consistent tracking, so not a lot of premium discount. You want to make sure it's happening safely. You want to make sure you're settling effectively for APs. You want to make sure that the market makers and the APs like the setup that you've built so that they feel confident in it because they price that risk into the markets. And that ultimately is money out of clients' pockets. So this is this is what we spend a lot of time doing. Mm -hmm. And the wirehouses, this is the stuff they really care about. They really only care about three things with these products from what we've seen. And it's client service, research, and like operational integrity. And I think our our partnership, ironically, was really built on those three pillars. And it's it's a reflection of who we are as a firm. And I think ultimately the uh, the clients we serve. And one measure of operational integrity and excellence is spreads. And I think for me, the biggest surprise shouldn't have been because uh, of uh, 21 shares history, but is that we have the tightest spreads on most days tighter than BlackRock, tighter than Fidelity. Uh, and that is the true measure of operational excellence. Hmm. What about, um, maybe we could talk about the ETH ETF. What do you, so there's been $75 billion of demand for the Bitcoin ETF so far. I guess if you just, it's a layman's way of adding that up. I'm just adding up all the, all the ETFs so far. What do you think the demand looks like for the ETH ETF? Short answer is less. I and mean, then you can see that if you look at other markets um, for a variety of reasons. Uh, it's typically a later stage thing for somebody to understand. It's been my experience that people come in, they understand Bitcoin, and then they start to, to get into um, other technologies. I think it's a little bit earlier. There's been less institutional adoption. I think there's been a lot of interest in the underlying technology, but mm -hmm. I don't know there's been, that there's been as much just raw education um, yeah. in how, Ethereum as there has been in Bitcoin over the last maybe five five years. How, how much less do you think, Ophelia? Because I, I just pulled up the um, the Bitcoin to ETH chart and it's sitting at around 20 today. Um, so would you say there's 20 times less demand for Bit, for ETH than Bitcoin? Is that a fair, is that like a fair way to look at it? That seems fairly extreme to me mm -hmm. in terms of what that delta is. And especially because of because of what just happened with the Bitcoin right. ETF, right? So yeah. that's, that's probably a, 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 not not a, a good analogy. Yeah. But if you look at if you look at like European markets, for example, right, you'll get 
maybe just depends on the product line, depends on the issuer, but maybe anywhere from like 50% the size kind of range, somewhere in there. Nice. One of the things, in, in, sorry, just in terms of sizing the opportunity, which is we spend a lot of time doing that. You know, in Bitcoin, you're talking about a global monetary system. You're talking about a technology and you're talking about store of value. And we think ultimately uh, it will play all, all, all three roles of money. So uh, and a new asset class, new asset class. So you've got three major. So monetary system, technology, new asset class. Um, the e e e Ethereum. Um, I mean, some people will say maybe it will be a, a currency, but it will not be a, a monetary system the way that, that Bitcoin is. Bitcoin is the most secure. And, you know, I think when people ask us, OK, how's this all going to shake out? Is is Bitcoin going to take usurp the, the dollar's role as the world's reserve currency? We don't think so. We think the strong are going to get stronger. And what I mentioned earlier the emerging market currencies are probably where you're going to see a lot of defections. So it's a very big idea. Uh, and we think it will be the biggest by far it will dominate the crypto asset ecosystem. I'm not sure, Ophelia, if, uh, if you feel uh, as strongly about that, I think our team does. So it will account, we think, for more for more than half of uh, the crypto asset ecosystem, ultimately. Oh, I don't mean long term. I'm thinking more like size of ETF flows, right? Right. So when I think about the like the institutional demand side of that equation, I, I agree with your your long term view that I think um, there's a lot more that can be done beyond just monetary um, monetary theory uh, in, in digital assets. I think there's going to be it, it's revolutionary and it touches almost every industry, and I think that will end up being the dominant use case over time. Mm -hmm. I think when you look at short-term institutional demand on a 90-day time horizon, there's just been less, yeah. there's been a lot less education around these topics. And these topics are substantially more complicated, yeah. right? People understand how the dollar works and people understand how reserve currencies work because we all have to deal with them every day. People have a much more limited understanding of how financial systems work, of how the internet actually works, of how like e-commerce actually works and visa networks. These are, this is, there's a much higher burden of education to this um, than I think there is for Bitcoin just because of the timing, right? Like Bitcoin people have been talking about for 10 years. There haven't, there hasn't been as much education in institutional circles on some of these other use cases. I do think that's changing. Um, it's interesting. I, I, I actually, one of the first things I read when I came into crypto was one of Chris's other books, uh, which divided the world into crypto assets, uh, crypto commodities, and then like sort of tokens and, and tokenized application layers. And I think that all, that made a lot of sense to me. I think that will be part of how people explain this, mm -hmm. this idea that you can have assets that are current, cryptocurrencies that are actual currency. You can have commodities like Ethereum, which are essentially primary inputs in the production of a service, right? And it's the equivalent of buying like iron ore, right? You're using it to then produce a service for somebody and whether that is a, you know, decentralized financial interaction or, or something else, right? It's, it's a primary input. And I think that will take a little bit longer for people to connect to and, and fully understand. Yeah. Um, we try to break that down as much as possible. But again, it took quite some time for commodities to fully reach their potential in, in investment portfolios. And I think that that time horizon is a little longer for ETH than it has been for Bitcoin. Yeah, we're seeing the exact same. So we have, so we have Blockworks, the media company and events and podcasts and all that stuff. And then we have a, a research and analytics platform called Blockworks Research. And one of the things inside of the analytics section is um, we build kind of P&Ls for a lot of these things. And so you can kind of, you can put a P&L around Uniswap or Maker. But when you start trying to put a P&L around like Ethereum, really what you start to realize is like this is more of a this is a commodity you don't have a pnl for oil it's a it's an right. asset that gets used for something else so yeah we're we're having the same conversations actually that you guys are having i'm starting to realize but <laughs> um kathy you uh you called for one i think it was 1.5 million bitcoin um I, I forget when you made that call but i think the call is 1.5 million by 2027 curious how you 
still think about that call. So that's by 2030. It was 2030, by 2030. 2030. And, and, and it stands, but I'll tell you, that is the bull case, the bear case. I mean, the base case for uh, 2030 was roughly $650,000. However, what, what has just happened, the green light from the SEC, uh, we believe will, um, <clears throat> will cause the institutional uh, participation to move towards the bull end of our set of assumptions, which was closer to the 5% asset allocation to Bitcoin over time. Uh, uh, so we think that probability has gone up. So the probability of the bull case, the 1.5 million has gone up. <laughs> nice. Do you, what, what do you both think is the likelihood that we'll get something like a Beyond Bitcoin and, and ETH, uh, Solana, Avalanche, whatever you want to, other assets you want to throw in there. I don't want to pick any names, but what is the likelihood that we get some of these ETFs in 2024? What is the likelihood we get some of these ETFs in 2025? I would, I would assume it's slim to none in 24, but actually relatively likely in 25. But I'm curious what you, as the experts, think here. Ophelia is much closer to to the regulatory, so. I, I can take this one. Um so I, I think it's really important to understand why these things get approved, because I think there's a misconception on the logic. Um, so the, the Bitcoin ETF got approved on the basis of a lawsuit, not not because there was a fundamental change of heart at the regulator. So just start with that, right? So this is a direct result of the judiciary mm. challenging a policy of regulation through enforcement. Uh, specifically, there was a lawsuit on this topic. That was it. Um, now, assuming you look at, you look at this as a point in time, you then need to look at what, what's the basis for that. And it comes down to, typically speaking, like two things. There are two key components. One is market microstructure. So, for example, if you you need to have a large exchange of significant size, like the futures market that is regulated and overseen, something like CME, that is very, very closely correlated to the underlying asset price so that asset price discoverability is there. Pricing discoverability is there, right? There, there's a bunch of check boxes on like, what does the market structure look like and does it actually meet criteria? And those criteria have largely been set by prior rejections of the Bitcoin ETF, but there is some precedent for them. The other thing you need is in order to list a financial product of any kind, you need to have categorized the underlying asset because whether it's a security or a commodity or something new, it needs to fit within um, rules and regulations around derivatives, right? So whether those are futures or other things, right? And, and which regulator has oversight on this differs. Now, there are a bunch of lawsuits in the United States right now, including one with Coinbase, including one with Binance, specifically about what are these things? Right. And we've been reading about that quite a bit. And it's coming down to what, what features do they have? What does utility look like? Um, how is the ICO run? What is the underlying use case of this asset? Why are people buying it? Where are they buying it? What constitutes an investment contract, et cetera? So the, the issue is that if you don't have clarity on that, it makes it very difficult to then package a product off of it. Now, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. Ethereum is pretty clear cut. It's a commodity. Easy. Right. And it's pretty well established in the United States also. So that's a very different conversation. But once you get beyond that, you're talking about some of these other assets. There's not a lot of clarity on that topic within the U.S. framework. Now, those are the only two reasons. There's nothing inherent to those assets that creates a problem. We run a nearly billion dollar Solana product in the European market with no issues and have for years. And it stakes and the staking yields compound to the product, no issues. No tax issues, no regulatory issues. It works in Switzerland. It's those th that second question is clear. You can package them this way. They have a clear status that that solves this issue. But as a result of the fact that the market structure differs between Bitcoin and ETH on one side versus everything else on the other, and the fact that there's a lack of clarity in the second category, I think unless you see some resolution on one of those two points. Over the next 12 months, you're probably not going to see any movement beyond those first couple of names. 
Makes and sense. It, there's sort of a chicken and an egg problem, right? You, you need to solve these problems before you could conceivably get something across the line. So I would put 2024 at zero and I would put 2025 at a low probability, maybe depending on what happens over the course of 2024. I think the, a lot of this will be determined by what policies are set after the presidential election. Right. So who's in power? What are we doing? What's the, what is the, what is the executive branch's policy on these topics? Because we all forget the SEC is an extension of the exec branch, right? They are part of the executive, which means whatever policy gets set by whoever is president is going to end up determining how these things happen. And that, I think, is actually the biggest wild card in this setup. So I yeah. wouldn't be looking for 2024 beyond Bitcoin and ETH. As we start, also realize you need 240 days, which means that unless someone's filing that it, it, very, very, very yeah. soon, you're not, this isn't happening. You're not right? making it. It's a 240 yeah. day cycle. You're not making 2024 unless you see something in the next you know, 60 days from somebody. It's not happening. Yeah. Um, once you get beyond that, 2025, a lot of this is going to come down to what happens in November. And I think that it's going to end up being a major moment for crypto in terms of what direction regulations in this country take. We should also, uh, Ophelia, mention <clears throat> that we are one of the first two in line for the ETH uh, uh, approval. And, uh, you know, the, I think the probability is probably going down. I, do you agree with that? Because, uh, you know, one of the one of the telltale signs for Bitcoin that something was going to happen with the spot Bitcoin ETF was uh, the fact that we ha were communicating with the SEC. Um, and unless uh, Ophelia knows something I don't know, I, I just think that the SEC um, is still biding its time, maybe studying the issues from what we can tell. I think the one thing that gives me some hope here, and I think I'm less less bearish on this than others, is that there is a there's not a lot of differences between these filings for Ethereum and the filings for Bitcoin. They're the same structure, the same custodians, yeah. the same disclosures. It, it's very con internally consistent. Um, that means there's less to look at, right? Yeah. And there's less to look at given that these were only done a couple months ago. Mm -hmm. So there's also that, right? If these had been done 20 years ago, that would be a different discussion and you might want to revisit it. But given how fresh most of the documentation is, um, that's the one thing I think that puts me at a, let's say, more optimistic mm -hmm. than it seems like most uh, So. So um, let's call it most markets would put it today. <laughs> yeah. it, what is that? I can't read it. Is that 20%? Uh, yeah, this is so if you're watching on uh, or if you're listening, I'm showing a poly market thing. Ethereum ETF approved by May 31st. It's gone from about 80% likelihood in January down to about 23% likelihood uh, today. And uh, so, and our filings, uh, if they're going to be approved, that will be a May event. Uh, so, I'm happy to hear uh, uh, Ophelia slightly more optimistic, mm. and I think fitting in with what she says is yes. There's a there there are futures out there on uh, on ether. Uh, the same was true with Bitcoin. So fitting into similar structure, similar setup. The the difference though, I don't know. I don't know who has staking still in their filings. Maybe everyone still does. I I, I think that has been a sticking point. Uh, and has anyone pulled a staking out, uh, Ophelia? Uh, no, I actually think a couple of people have added it in recently. Well, I saw Fidelity I had, and that to me said, okay, they're adding it in. That's, since that seems to be the sticking point, maybe they don't believe uh, anything's going to be approved and they're just saying, what the heck? Interesting. Or maybe they're really excited. They know it's all getting approved, Kathy. Maybe. Uh, maybe but you would have thought the probabilities were... <laughs> that you just presented would have gone up on that if that were true. Yeah, that's true. That's true. So uh, that's why you're the investor uh, and I'm not. So anyways, I know I know we're at, at time here. So Kathy, uh, Ophelia, this this was awesome. Anything else that uh, we, we missed that you really want to discuss here? Or we could also save it for a second podcast that we could definitely do in the near future. I would just say watch currencies out there. You know, we I, I'm going to say when we were 
uh, brainstorming about Bitcoin in early days, but r- really we've had this thought continuously that is that at some point, you know, the, th- this Bitcoin and the insurance policy, the protection to purchasing power and wealth that it represents could be the reason you'll see, you know, some of these marginal currencies having problems. And mm-hmm. uh, I don't know if it started already, um, uh, but I think the ETFs and 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 how much uh, how quickly they've evolved and all the education around Bitcoin that uh, you know marketing teams have put out there. Uh, might have might have helped that uh, scenario along to some extent. That's a great point. Um, Ophelia, Kathy, thank you both so much for the time. Uh, this is awesome. I'm sure we'll do round two at some point in the near future. And yeah, congrats on everything. Third place behind BlackRock and Fidelity is a good place to be right now. So <laughs> thank you so thank much. You. Hey, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to today's episode. Don't forget to claim your free wormhole NFT exclusive to Empire listeners. Hit the link in the description of today's episode and fill out the form to claim your unique wormhole NFT today.